Every year, an estimated 400,000 children and adolescents of 0 to 19 years old develop cancer. The World Health Organization evaluated that 30,000 children are diagnosed with the disease yearly, with 80% of them living in low- and middle-income countries such as Nigeria. The president, Nigerian Society for Pediatric Oncology, Dr. Adeshete Michael, or Adeshe Michael Akishete, a consultant hematologist and oncologist and team lead monitoring evaluation research and learning a Spire Coronation Trust Foundation. That's Samuel Iga. They're both joining us now to discuss the need to create awareness on childhood cancer as the world marks the International Childhood Cancer Day today. And that's the 15th of February. Thank you, gentlemen, for being here. Thank you. Dr. Akin Shetel, I'll start with you. Now, we saw the figure for global um, um, childhood cancer, about 400,000. And I know we don't have a lot of data, Nigeria specifically, but what's responsible for this um, number that we're seeing annually, especially in children. So thank you for having me once again. I think that, um, so 400,000 is what the WHO has put forth as the number of kids having. However, 50% of them are not diagnosed. And that 50% resides mainly in LMICs like us. Now, the increased awareness is responsible for the increased figures. Um, for places like Nigeria, where we don't have real um, live data, um, we've had statistical models used to predict how many cases we see yearly. So you would find for Nigeria that GlobalCan, which is a global cancer observatory, has um, put forward that we see about 8,500 new cases every year amongst children. Now, this is actually less than what we think we see um, so what we have done now is that first things first is we've tried to start a population-based pediatric oncology registry that was supported by the Federal Ministry of Health and the um, National Institute for Cancer Research and Treatment. And that has started in Lagos. It was launched December 22nd. So what we want to do with that is get real-life data across two local governments in Nigeria, and then statistically we can extrapolate for the nation. What we tend to do is that over the next 12 months, we will then be able to get this um, software across to other parts of the nation. And so the data goes into a central repository so that if we have this conversation a year from today, we can then be able to say, OK, over 12 months in Nigeria, we saw X amount of kids across this number of local governments in this number of states. So what we have now are estimates. In one year's time, we should have real figures. Right. And, and of course, we know data is a very critical starting point uh, in order for us to move to finding solutions and to finding ways to mitigate uh, the impact of what is going on. But while we're working through the process of collating uh, empirical data, what I'll come to you, Mr. Iga, what are the nonprofits doing to mitigate, uh, you know, the scourge of what we're seeing childhood cancer becoming in Nigeria? All right. Thank you very much. Um... So over the years, there's been a great trajectory with how nonprofits are able to mitigate cancer. So what we've been doing in recent times, we are um, looking at um, how that we can also improve awareness. Um, so we have organizations beginning to look at possible ways to partner with other organizations, other CB organizations across the states, across different states of the, of the country, just so that we're able to mitigate cancer at different levels. We were also doing this to, um, for instance, at ACT Foundation, what we do also is to have, come up with a capacity development program that more like um, provides, um, you know, a, a training for some of these oncologists across the country. Like, you know, we have, it's, it's, it's no longer news that we have a number of um, oncologists who are also relocating as a result of the Jackpot syndrome. So we have a number of concerns about that. And so what we do is to train some of these oncologists just so that we are able to improve the, um, the percentage number of people who are able to get tested and also treated on with respect to cancer. So it's a growing concern, but we're doing the best we can and also working with other non-profit organizations to see how we can mitigate this. Awesome. Well done for that. Well, Dr. Kinshita, back to you. You mentioned that you started a registry. I believe that was in December. And of course, the, it's, it's hard because we're in Nigeria where data is more or less a luxury or non-existent. So I'm just wondering, what are, what are the, do you have everything that you need when it comes to gathering the statistics <laughs> for this? Are you laughing? Am I, am I hitting the nail on the head on this? Or are you experiencing some real challenges? I mean, it's interesting. I mean, you asked if we had all we need. <laughs> 
I don't think anyone has all what they need. So um, starting that registry was a first step for us because it's quite shameful you go to meetings and then when they get to us, there's this black spot over us. So starting a pediatric oncology population-based registry, first is training. We had to fund the training of the registrars we had. We had support from nonprofits to equip the registry. I mean, put um, desktop computers, um, get internet access. Now there's a software that is needed which gets you data real time and uploads to the cloud. That's still a tricky area for us now. So we're doing the paper-based form of it because it's, pretty, it's a bit tricky and it's quite expensive to get that software. So hopefully we think that once we have some form of traction with regards to paper-based registration, I think we can then put forward a grant application to get funding to get the real life uh, software which is adaptable to our situation. What we've seen with um, foreign funders is that when you have a pilot data, then they see that you have a skin in the game and they're ready to fund you. But when you just keep twiddling your thumbs and you say, look, we don't have anything, we don't, nobody's really going to put their funds in you. So we believe that in six months time, we will have enough paper-based data, which we can then publish as a pilot data for us to then attract the right funding for the right software. Absolutely. Now, of course, we know the numbers are very important, but let's look at the medical side of this. Uh, it's often said prevention is better than cure. Uh, childhood cancer, mm -hmm. how preventable is it, Dr. Akinshete? <laughs> so they are not preventable. So you, you find that the narrative for adult cancers is oh, prevention, prevention, prevention. In pediatric cancers, most of them are genetic based. So they are problems that occurred with the genes while the babies were in the mother's womb, or occurred with the genes while the babies were or while the kids were growing up. So from that standpoint, it's not preventable. However, you can screen early and make prompt diagnosis and then treat. So data has shown that if you look at the kids who are in high income countries, 80% of them will survive. When you flip it and come to Nigeria, across Nigeria, if you put everybody's data together, only 20% will survive. So out of every 10, we will keep two. Now, what has happened is that we've looked at the ecosystem. So we published the paper two years back. And what we found was that parents actually go to the hospitals early. But what happens is that Navigating the Nigerian healthcare space builds up so many years, I mean, months and months of uncertainty that by the time the child gets to where you can give care and cure, the diseases are advanced. Mm -hmm. So what we have done is that we flipped it on the head. Before we used to blame the parents, so they don't come early, they don't come early. No, now we know they come early. So we're now educating the healthcare professionals at the bottom of the pyramid, primary healthcare workers, primary care physicians, nurses, pharmacists. If you see, for example, when you shine a torch into the eye of a, any individual, you should return a red reflex. When you shine a torch and it returns a white reflex in a child, that's a danger sign. It may be retinoblastoma. And we've had a child whose mom noticed it, went to a hospital, spent six months in different hospitals, by the time the child got to us, the eye was proptosed. Because everyone kept saying, oh, it's a cataract. Oh, it's not a cataract. Oh, it's a glaucoma. All sorts. So what we've done now is we've gone back to, base, to the basics. We've gone to the bottom of the pyramid. We are educating them. We do a pre-test sampling. We educate. We do a post-test. Once they have a critical number with regards how much knowledge they have, then we scale to them the five early signs, warning signs. Once you see a child like this, please don't send to a general hospital. Send to a teaching hospital. Across Nigeria, we have 70, 76 pediatric oncologists in 42 institutions who can treat some form of cancer. And what they know is that if they can't treat that cancer, then they will accelerate the referral that kindly go to this place and get the right treatment. So that's what we're trying to do. We've seen that sometimes it's not the money that will fix the system. It's that when you look into your system and identify the bottlenecks, you may just fix it with the right kind of knowledge, the right kind of attitude, and, you know, and then you get to a point where money may now be able to fix the things you need. All these bottlenecks are, are, are really 
an issue. I mean, it's a vivid picture you're painting, and it's very unfortunate. But, um, Mr. Iga, bearing in mind all that Dr. Kinshita has painted, you know, which of this, what, what can you do as, you know, representing the NGOs to make sure that all the stakeholders that are involved and might be contributing to this, these bottlenecks pull their weight and we see, you know, less situations like this? Yeah, thank you very much. I mean, um, the non-profit space can't do it alone. So, uh, so we are looking at multiple collaborations across um, um, the, um, the government agencies, private sector organizations, you know, um, um, even religious institutions, because we need to put the word out there that this is actually a growing challenge, you know, and then how that we can work together to um, raise awareness to improve the chances of people getting treated, even for even children. You know, so it's no longer, uh, we don't no, no longer look at cancer as an adult thing now. You now understand that children also, you know, um, have cancers and so they need to get treated. They need to, um, the world needs to be out there that they, um, they need to um, access treatment early. So, so we're looking at working with multiple um, organizations, um, public sector, private sector organizations, seeing how we can pull our weights together because if we come together and then put our weights together, we would achieve much more. Absolutely. Now, Dr. Kinshade, you've already given us an insight into the importance of the healthcare system itself being made more conscious and aware of what we're dealing with. But uh, how can we improve the outcomes of childhood cancer? So let me just give you, in 30, 45 seconds, a classic example. So in 2012, we published a paper, Wilms tumor is a type of kidney cancer that children have. It's common between two to five years and it's very common in Africans and in females. Now, back then it was 35% survival we had when we looked at the five years. Old. So we looked at that ecosystem. We looked at all the people who were working on Wilms tumor in the hospital in Lagos. And we found that people weren't talking to each other. We were all working in silos. So we decided in 2015, we had a meeting in 2014, and then decided that everybody, once a child with Wilms tumor comes into the hospital, would have a start meeting, would all decide when is this child going to get chemotherapy, when will this child get surgery, when will this child get radiotherapy, what's the cost of each of these. So we knew the cost, we handed it over to a not-for-profit, kindly help us source the funding for these steps. The parents have X amount of money. Now we published data in 2021. We've moved from 35% to 80% survival rate just by that because we learned to talk to each other. So I wasn't working in a silo again. So the surgeon knows that I'm supposed to see this child July 1st. If I don't see on July 1st, he gives me a ring. I haven't seen this patient July 1st, why? I call the parents, why aren't you there? So the NGO activates, so we have people we call patient navigators. They go find out from the parents, you haven't come to the hospital, why haven't you? Now in all of this, if we had thrown money at the system, it wouldn't have fixed it, but the people who were in that ecosystem learned to talk to each other. And now we're trying to replicate it for brain tumors in children, for acute lymphoblastic um, leukemias, which are blood cancers, that if the professionals first learn to talk to each other, we can narrow the pains of the parents by 35%, and that improves outcome by almost 50%. So we think that if this model is even used generally in the ecosystem now, which is what we are planning that. Primary talks to tertiary, tertiary gives feedback, you know, labs talk to surgery, theater talks to, at the end of the day, we will be able to get the impact and the numbers we've gotten with Wilms tumor. Well, as we begin to round up with you, thank you for that, of course. Mr. Ega, I'm just wondering, because I'm, I'm definitely curious, how you're able to still continue the work that you're doing in the midst of the current situation, the current Niger um, Nigerian situation we find ourselves in, whether it's the economy, whatever, how is this, is this fresh frustrating your efforts or are you making your way around it? Uh, Briefly, I mean, please. It's a growing concern. We're all aware of what's, what's happening with the economy and all that, but these problems are still staring us at, at the face, so we can't run away from these problems. Looking at cancer, it may be cancer today, it might be another thing tomorrow. So these are growing concerns that we have, so we continue to look for ways, innovative ways to, you know, 
provide solutions to this problem, not just in Nigeria, it's all over Africa. You know, the, the rates of cancer, it's, I think I was reading the paper recently and I was, I was, I was seeing things like 200,000 um, children are diagnosed of cancer annually, and that's a huge number. So these are concerns that are upcoming and they will continue to come, but we just have to look for ways, innovative ways, through partnerships, through different funding opportunities, just so that we are able to mitigate these challenges and provide solutions across. Fantastic. Dr. Adeshe Michael Akinshete, consultant hematologist, oncologist, thus, and your president of Nigerian Society of Pediatric Oncology. And of course, Mr. Samuel Eager, team lead monitoring, evaluation, research, and learning from Aspire Coronation Trust Foundation. Thank you so much for Thank the incredible you. work that you're doing. And uh, we hope that you continue to push forward and that you get all the resources you need to make the necessary impact. Yeah. Thank you for having us. Thank you.